For our final speaker of the day, certainly maybe last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Yael Ziegler, who's going to be speaking on Moshe, man of God, man among men. I thought maybe you were speaking about my husband for a minute there, but eh, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Dr. Yael Ziegler is Rosh Bate Midrash of Matan and is senior lecturer in Tanakh at Herzog College. She received her BA from Stern College and an MA and PhD at Bar Ilan University. Dr. Ziegler has lectured wild, wild, wildly and widely, right? <laughs> if you've ever heard her speak before, on various Tanakh topics in Israel, the United States, South Africa, Australia, and Europe. Isn't that the entire world, right? <laughs> I think, right? And has authored multiple books on Tanakh. Uh, who I very often borrow heavily from. I will, I will say that with pride, with pride. It is an absolute honor for me to present to you Dr. Yael Ziegler. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to speak in memory of uh, Moshe Meir Ben Avram Kohen Verifka Rachel. Um, we've heard today, uh, well, we recently heard about the end of Moshe's life. And, you know, uh, Rev. Alex gave a little bit of an overview of Moshe's life. So I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of Moshe's life. And um, I'm going to begin with the question. I mean, you know, as Rev. Alex said, Moshe has so many things, right? And Moshe is, is so many things, therefore he's anything anyone wants him to be, right? He's philosopher and he's the Isha Elohim. He's the ultimate leader. He's the ultimate educator. He's the legislator. Right, uh, you know, uh, Heinrich Heine once said about uh, Moshe, um, he said, Sinai seems very small when Moshe is standing upon it, right? That Moshe looms large, he looms large in the Tanakh, and he looms large in our lives, right? I mean, Moshe really is, uh, in many ways, really the ultimate figure of Judaism, right? And so there's just so much to say about Moshe. Um, I, I want to ask a, a rather uh, modest question or a narrow question, and that is, why does God select Moshe to begin with? Right? Who is Moshe at the very beginning? And this is the sort of question that you can't ask about everybody. Right? In other words, you really can't ask that question, for example, about Abraham. I mean, you can ask the question, but you're not going to find a ready answer because Abraham seems to be sort of plucked out of nowhere. And the Midrashim, of course, do address this question, right? Many of you are thinking of, oh yeah, but Abraham, he was in the, uh, the furnace of, of fire, right? He was in the Kibshana age. And those stories are answering the question of the lacuna in the Tanakh with regard to Avram's selection. We actually don't know. We don't have the answer of why God turned to Avram, you know, sort of out of the blue, lech lecha meretzecha, meretzecha, mibet avicha, el ha'aretz, asher eka, right, get up and go. We don't actually have the answer with regard to Avram. And with regard to Moshe, I think we're better suited to find an answer, and that is because when Moshe is selected by God at the burning bush, we already know Moshe quite well, right? We've already had a, a pretty extensive introduction to Moshe, a full parak, right? And you know, within the context of Tanakh, a full parak to introduce us to Moshe is quite a lot. It's not necessarily uh, with regard to Moshe's life, right? Because so much of the Torah <coughs> is devoted to Moshe's life. But we still have a full chapter that really describes to us the beginnings of Moshe, <laughs> the kind of introductory chapter to Moshe. I'll just draw your attention to um, this machloket this uh, kind of debate with regard to Moshe's initial character at the very outset of the story. So this is actually not the very outset of the story. The very beginning of the burning bush story is what I brought for you here at the beginning of the source sheet, where right before Moshe goes out and you know discovers this burning bush and has this first theophany, this first revelation by God. So the story is introduced in, in source number one, Umoshe haya ro'e et son yitro chotno, Kohen Midian, Vayinhag et atzon achar hamidbar, Vayavo el har ha Elohim choreva. Right, so the description here is of Moshe, who is shepherding the sheep, and uh, the Mepharshim comment on the fact that he takes these sheep achar hamidbar, right? He takes them out after the wilderness, and why is he going into the wilderness, and you know, kind of what leads him in the direction of Chorev, which is this mountain, which is you know embedded so deeply in this wilderness, and why is he taking sheep into the wilderness? So we have uh, two basic approaches. I think 
Rashi's approach we're always a little bit more familiar with. So we'll start with Rashi's approach, Achar Hamidbar. Why does Moshe take his sheep to the desert? Right? Because he wants to distance himself from any possibility that he could engage in any kind of immoral behavior. He doesn't want to possibly lead his sheep into a place where he could be using other people's pastures. So the idea of going into the desert is <clears throat> to make sure that he maintains his morality, right? That there should be no question as to where he's taking his sheep. Sfarno goes in a completely different direction, right? And Sfarno says, that was the destination. That was the goal. The idea of going down into the desert was who livado, lihit boded, ulihit palel, right? So according to the Sforno, uh, Moshe was the first Breslover, right? He goes off into the desert in order to do hit bodedud, right? In order to be alone, in order to uh, somehow commune with God, right? So what I want to just start at, by suggesting at the very outset is, is that these are two very different conceptions of Moshe. Who is Moshe? So Raji says, Moshe is moral man, right? Sforno says, Moshe is this divine seeker, right? Moshe is man of God, right? Now, the answer, of course, to the question is, I think, as Rev. Alex kind of uh, pointed out, he's both, right? He's, he's very much both. I mean, I think Rev. Alex sort of drew our attention to the fact that at some point in his life, he sort of seems to retreat into the man of God aspect of his, um, of his, of his nature or of his, of his role, of his goals. Um, and yet, at the same time, he never ceases to be the leader, right? He has some, uh, you know, he has some kind of moments of hesitation, certainly in these partiot that we're reading, but he retains his balance and he maintains his balance. And it's a uh, very much a feature of Moshe that he is both of these things. Um, but still, that doesn't answer the question. What I really want to ask is, is why is he selected, right? Can we really discern why Moshe is selected? And as I said, to properly see this, we have to go back to Perak Bet, right? We have to go back to that initial story where we first meet Moshe. <clears throat> this is a great story. I love teaching Shemot Perak Bet. I love teaching it for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that I love teaching it is because it's such a literary piece, right? And I like to look at the Tanakh from the literary viewpoint and see how we can use our literary tools that we use in teaching literature to draw out of the Tanakh its deeper messages, its theological messages. And so we have this story of Moshe, this initial story of Moshe in Perak Bet, which is really, I think, a beautiful literary chapter. It's divided very neatly into two, right? So that the first 10 verses of the chapter are the story of Moshe's birth, which itself, I think, by the way, is a question, right? Why do we need 10 you know, verses to tell us about somebody's birth, right? This, uh, this is always a question. I mean, we do have people who have birth stories in Tanakh, right? We, you know, uh, Shmuel gets a very long birth story. Shimshon gets a very long birth story. Uh, there are not a few characters that get birth stories, but still not everybody gets one at all, right? And so when we do have a figure who has a very extensive story of his birth, we want to be looking at that birth story as telling us something about his destiny, right? About the reason for his birth, right? I will say one thing about Moshe and about Moshe's birth story, and this is already food for thought, and that is that, of course, uh, you know, all birth stories in Tanakh revolve around a crisis. I mean, I'll say it more generally. All good stories revolve around a crisis, right? But all the birth stories in Tanakh revolve around the same crisis, which is, of course, barrenness, right? Akrut. Right? There are a lot of barren women in Tanakh, and that itself is an important feature of Tanakh, and we won't get into that right now. But not the Moshe story. So the Moshe story has a crisis also, but the crisis is not, will this child be born? Will this child be conceived? Because there is no problem of barrenness in Egypt. That's an Eretz Yisrael problem, where there's no river, right? There is land infertility, and there is human infertility in the land of Israel. Why? Well, we're told the same thing about barren earth as we're told about barren women. And that is that God wants our tefillot, right? God holds the keys, says the Gemara and Tani, to three things, right? Childbirth, rain, and triat revival of the dead, right? <clears throat> so those things 
are things that God wants us to develop a relationship with him in order to understand that those things are in God's hands. Well, that's not the case in Egypt. Right? In Egypt, there is a, 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 there's tremendous fertility in Egypt, both of land, of course, they have their Nile, and human fertility. Even Am Yisrael, Uvene Yisrael paru veishritzu veyirbu veyatzmu bimaod meod vatimalei haaretz otam. Right, there's lots and lots of fertility in Egypt. The problem is not fertility, the problem is morality, right? The question is not, will Moshe be conceived and born? The question is, will he survive to adulthood? Because in a society where there's so much fertility, human beings lose their value, right? They may lose their worth, right? There's a sense that the humans in Egypt, they don't have names, they don't have identity, they don't have individuality, they are cogs in the great mechanism of Egyptian slavery, right, of, of serving Paro. And so there's, you know, there's, there's this question um, or there's this crisis that appears in Moshe's birth, which is not typical of birth stories, and that immediately draws our attention to something that's going on in the story that is different, something that surrounds Moshe's birth that is different. Um, but, you know, to, just going back to the kind of literary weave of the chapter, the first part of the chapter is Moshe's birth. There we have a key word that appears seven times, right? Uh, uh, Professor Casuto uh, teaches that anytime you have a word that appears in a section in a multiple of sevens, and he spends a lot of time in Bereshit Perak Aleph describing this. So that, that's a key word of the section. That's a word which is deliberately highlighted in the section. The key word in the first section, in the section of Moshe's birth, is the word Hayeled, right? The boy. That shouldn't surprise us at all, right? It's the story of Leida, right? Of a birth of a child. Now, the second part of the story, I think, is a little bit more interesting, both in terms of the, uh, the events that take place, or I would say more obvious, more typical, because they're telling us the beginning of Moshe's life, right? Moshe is actually an active participant in the second part of the story. He's passive recipient in the first part of the story, but in the second part of the story, we have Moshe, early adulthood, emerges from the palace. Rev. Alex talked about it before. We'll maybe expand upon it a little bit today. He emerges, he does all these great acts of salvation. And the key word in the second part of the chapter, which appears seven times, is ish, ish, right? Okay, so again, that shouldn't really surprise us, right? Because of course, first part is Moshe the baby, second part is Moshe the man. But that's not accurate, okay? I'm gonna say two things, and we'll get back to this afterwards. One is that the word ish in the second part of the chapter does not usually describe Moshe, right? It's the Ish Mitzri, it's the Ish Ivri, it's the Ish Reuel. There's a lot of Ish going on, but it's not, it's not accurate to call the second part of the chapter Moshe Ha'ish, because we're inclined to immediately assume that, right? Because the first part of the chapter is seven times Hayeled, second part of the chapter is seven times Ish. We think must be the growth, the maturation of this child who has now grown up and is a man. That's not accurate, okay? The other thing is, is Note this as well, that as opposed to the first part of the chapter, where the word yelet appears with the hey hayidia, the definite article, the child, in the second part of the chapter, it's mostly, not always, it's mostly ish, a man, okay? It's not the man, it's a man. <clears throat> I'll just say, you know, at the outset, and we'll get to it in a few more minutes, uh, that the idea of the second part of the chapter is not Moshe, the man, it is Moshe in search of a man so that he can become a man, okay? He's looking for a role model, okay? So that is a whole kind of different twist on what we're going to be looking at. Okay, now uh, let's start, though, with this first part of the chapter, Moshe, the uh, passive recipient, the child. Um, I, I want to note basically two points. I really want to get to the second part of the chapter and spend most of our time there, but I want <clears throat> to note two points about this opening of the chapter. The first thing that I think we have to note is, is that Moshe is born twice, right? Moshe has two mothers, two wombs, right? We have the biological womb and the 
the Teva, right? We have that, the, the Ark, right? And it's floating in the water, right? In the first part of the chapter, we have Moshe emerging from his mother's womb. She sees him, Vatera Oto, right? Look in uh, Pasuk Bet, Vatar Aisha, no problem there with fertility, right? The woman becomes pregnant, Vatelet Ben, and she gives birth to a son, Vatera Oto Kitovu. And she sees that he's good. We won't get into that for a moment. I assume most mothers think their children are good, but um, certainly when they're born. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, the, she sees him, and then she determines to save him, right? Well, a similar thing happens with his adoptive mother, right? Moshe has two mothers. Look in Pasuk Vav, right? When uh, Bat Paro uh, receives that womb-like Teva, that womb-like ark. What are we told? Pasuk vav, vatiftach, and she opens it, vatir ehu et hayeled, and she sees him, the boy, right? She sees this boy, and then she determines to save him, right? So that we have this kind of uh, dual birth of Moshe, two mothers, both of whom uh, go out of the way, I would say, endanger their lives to save him, right? I would say Bat Paro is even more shocking than his mother, than his biological mother. Not only is she not his biological mother and she determines to save him, but in doing so, what has she done? She has thwarted the will of her father, who is, of course, probably the most powerful man in the ancient world at the time, certainly in Egypt. Um, the baby Moshe is a product of two mothers, two identities, two opposing cultures opposing cultures, right? We have the Israelite culture and the Egyptian culture. Um, and of course, that explains what transpires at the end of this section, where if you look in Pasuk Yud here, Vaigdal Hayeled, the boy grows up, but to the Eulvat Paro, Vaila Leven, she becomes for him a child, right? She becomes the mother. Uh Moshe, and she calls his name Moshe, Vatomer Kimin Hamaim. And she says, for I have drawn him from the water. So who names him Moshe? Right? So it seems Bad Paro names him Moshe, right? But that is, of course, the source of great exegetical debate, right? The name Moshe itself is a very complex amalgamation between the two cultures that Moshe is born into, right? The name Moshe seems to be a Hebrew name, Kimin Hamaim for I have drawn him from the water. And yet, of course, we know Moses, right? That is, the Nitziv already notes this, right? I mean, you know, we certainly have more knowledge today of the Egyptian language than Rashi did, right? But the name Mose or Moses, right, is a name that means birth, right, or, or born, right? So think of the name Ra Moses. Ra, the sun god Ra birthed him. Ach Moses, the moon god, birthed him. Tut Moses, right? The baboon god of Tuf, birthed him. And then you have Moshe, who's just born. Born of woman, right? Not born of a god. All of these different pharaohs are being named as if a god birthed them because, of course, they self-deify, right? They regard themselves as godlike in their powers, and therefore that's their name. In any case, though, certainly seems that the name itself is kind of complex. It's both Hebrew and it's certainly Egyptian, right? It, or let's put it this way. It's an Egyptian name with a Hebrew etymology, right? I think that already kind of puts it, 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 the, the complexity of Moshe's identity really puts it out there. Who actually named him? That's uh, um, an exegetical question, which we won't get into at this moment. The point that I want to make is, is that Moshe's identity is very complex from the outset. That's the first point, I think, that we see from the birth story. The second point, of course, that we see from the birth story is all of this effort that's being put into saving Moshe from this you know, very uh, difficult situation that he's been born into. Oh, I see that these uh, source sheets, do you have page two twice, like I do? Okay, it's fine. Uh, if you look at page two, no, just I do. Okay, uh, so if you look at page two, you see really that the story itself is told, the first part of the story, the birth story of Moshe, is told in this very neat, what we call chiastic structure. A chiastic structure is A, B, C, C, B, A, 
right? The classic, you know, the classic classic structure that really uh, provides strong evidence that the Tanakh contains deliberate chiastic structures is the pasuk when they come out of the teva with Noach shofech dam haadam baadam damo yishafech. Right? You hear it A B C C B A. Really, it means what goes around comes around. Right? You do A, you'll get A. Right? There's just something very neat about that. Um, our structure that we have here is a little bit less tight than that structure linguistically, but it, it, it also contains a middle. Okay? So it's, it's not exactly a chiastic structure, it's a concentric structure because it revolves around something that has no parallel, no match. Right? But the story is built as follows. Look in source two. We have the birth of a son, we have the, uh, the activity of the mother, we then have the activity of the sister. The turning point of the story is the activity of Paro's daughter. Then we go back to, the mo- back to the sister, who then says, I'll go find him somebody to nurse him, right? Back to the mother and the rebirth of this son, right? So that what we see here is this kind of incremental movement of the child away from the mother's womb, which puts him in increasing danger, right? As he gets farther and farther away from his birth, he becomes more and more in danger. And of course, the turning point of this is Bat Paro, who's the real surprise in the story, as we said before. She is the one who ultimately lets him be born again, right? Oh, that didn't sound right. <laughs> but <laughs> to be rebirthed, right? Where, where we know that he is going to be able to survive all of this danger. <clears throat> but the point that I really uh, think is, is um, well, maybe we'll just spend one moment on Bat Paro here. Why does Bat, Bat Paro save him, right? That's, that's a, a, a perplexity that is not exactly answered in the story. If you look back at the Pasuk, at Pasuk Vav, look at what it says. It says, Vatiftach, and she opens the ark, Vatir Ehu, and she sees him, Et Hayeled. So there are two things that happen here. One is she sees him and she sees that he is a child and then she has compassion on him, right? So that, you know, I think the the first thing in developing compassion is to be able to see the other, right? Don't forget what we said before, which is that nobody in this society has names, right? We talked about it a little bit also when we learned Megillat Rud, um, and, and that is that, you know, in, in the period of Sefer Shoftim, people have lost their names. A society without names is going to be a society without compassion. Because if you don't see a human being before you, if you don't see a subject, you only see objects, you only see Paro's slaves or Paro's potential slaves. So then you don't see them as having rights, and then you don't exercise compassion. And so the first thing that we have that really, I think, turns this story around in a positive direction is Bat Paro seeing this child, this human being, right, as uh, 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 an object who is worthy of compassion. Um, <clears throat> the word Hayeled right there, that, that's the middle word of this story. Literally, I mean, I'm not a word counter, but some are, right? If you count the words, I checked it, it is true, but I didn't find it, right? You have 70 words, then the word Hayeled, and then 70 words, okay? So it's the literal middle of the story, and it's the turning point of the story when she sees this child. And so human compassion lies at the center of the story of Moshe's birth, allowing Bat Paro to defy her father. But this story is, is the continuation of the story in Parak Aleph, which is the story of the midwives, right? Are those midwives Egyptians or are they Israelite midwives? Again, unclear. Hamiyaldot ha'ivriot could be the midwives of the Hebrews, or it could be the Hebrew midwives. About that, once again, there's a tremendous debate without resolution because it's deliberately ambiguous. Because the answer is, is we don't care whether they're Egyptians or Israelites. What we care about is that they have compassion, right? Now, and, and that's the same point that we have here as well. We have the Egyptian mother and the Israelite mother, and it's not biology 
which determines who has compassion here. The other thing, of course, that we have to note is that they're all women, right? They're all women here. And there's a tremendous, I think, uh, emphasis on the female compassion that really drives this story, that propels the story to its felicitous conclusion, which is, of course, that Moshe survives the story. And that itself is very much noted by Chazal. Right? Chazal talk a lot about bizchut nashim tzidkaniot, nigalu Yisrael mi Mitzrayim, right? The merit of compassionate women or, or righteous women uh, enabled Am Yisrael to survive. So I, I think that the story is turned around by women. Uh, it's turned around by empathy, by, by compassion, by exercising humanity. Uh, it, and not just any women, but women who are engaged in childbirth, right? Whether vicariously, as is the case with the midwives or with Bat Paro, or directly, right? The, the, the sense is, is that this story is showing us something that I think we know, which is that the foundation of compassion in society, I'll say it more, more, more directly, the foundation of rachamim in society is the rechem. Right? The foundation of compassion is the womb. Now that's not, that's not, I'm not making that up, right? Those words are etymologically related. Again, I'm not saying everybody who has a rechem is compassionate. I'm certainly not saying, don't worry, anyone who doesn't have a rechem does not have rachamim. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying something I think a little more subtle than that, which is that the, 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 the idea that human beings can exist together in a society, in a viable way, in a way in which people our compassion of one another, it's founded on the fact that we bring the next generation into existence, right? Similar, I think, uh, maybe to what Dr. Lichtenstein was saying, that, you know, the, the, that parents have an obligation to the next generation and that we're building our world for the next generation, right? And that's, that's the foundation of uh, compassion, of rachamim. Okay, so that's the story here of Moshe's birth, right? It's, it's really only because of the tenacity, the fortitude, the courage, the determination of the women in Moshe's life that Moshe becomes Moshe. That's the, the beginning of the story. And, and by the way, Moshe recognizes that this is a very formative element of his later leadership. In, in a section that, uh, that Rev. Alex quoted, right, which is a couple weeks ago when we read, uh, you know, when we read Moshe kind of giving up on leadership, and that's a, a bit of a negative context, I think I brought it for you here, where Moshe turns to God and says, Ha'anochi hariti et kol Did I conceive this nation? Imanochi yelantihu? Did I birth him? Ki tomar lai sa'eu v'chekecha, ka'asher yisa ha'omen et ha'yonek? You're telling me I should carry the child in my bosom like a nursemaid carries a child? In other words, what he's really recognizing is that in order to be a, an effective leader, in order to be a committed leader, in order to be a leader with passion, intensity, fortitude, tenacity to fight for the people, one has to embrace that maternal compassion that you've seen in the world, that you've noted in the world, that you've been a recipient of in the world, right? There is no relationship like, like the relationship of mother and child. And it becomes a metaphor for all good relationships, right? It doesn't mean that it's the only intense relationship to have, but it certainly means that that's the, the relationship from which we can draw our, um, our, our strength to have good relationships, to be a good leader, to be a person who sees the other and cares enough to do something. And that's what Moshe is really saying here. I mean, you know, Yeshayahu, uh, God says it in Yeshayahu as well, right? When, when Yerushalayim is complaining, we're going to read this in a couple of weeks, in the Nivuot of Nechama, when Yerushalayim is complaining, Azavani Hashem Hashem Shechani, right? God left me, he forsook me, and God forgot me, right? That's in the 49th chapter of Yeshayahu. God says, Hatishkach Isha Ula. Merachem ben bitna, can a mother forget her child? Can a mother cease to have compassion on the fruit of her womb? Right? That's God's question, right? So that it's a rhetorical question. Although he continues and says, Gam ela tishkachna vanochi lo eshkachech. Right? Even if she would, in 
you know, she's human after all, right? We did just read Echa, which has some, you know, rather uh, negative scenarios of mothers and children, but that becomes the mark of a viable society, right? The society that sees at its foundation this compassion that has been drawn by uh, acts that, that mothers do for their children. And that's the, the kind of the backdrop of Moshe. And so Moshe's birth story facilitates his destiny, right? It becomes a formative story in turning him into a leader. These uh, experiences, the, 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 those women who saw him and were willing to endanger their lives because they saw his personness and, and his right to existence and they, they, they passionately desired uh, his existence, that's what ultimately empowers him to search for, um, to see others, right? To search for justice for others and to uh, have compassion on others. Ultimately, of course, Moshe becomes a mialedet, right? He becomes a midwife. What does he do? He takes the people through the Reed Sea, right? Pulls them out on the other side and they are rebirthed, right? Because that's Moshe. That's Moshe's role. You know, the Ibn Ezra asks the question, I think I brought it for you, but we won't see it inside. The Ibn Ezra basically um, <clears throat> asks the question, why is his name Moshe? It should really be Mashui, right? right? He's, he's pulled. Not, he's not a puller. He's pulled. He's not Moshe. He's Mashui. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the right uh, uh, name based on the etymology. And um, I think the answer to Ibn Ezra's question, which he actually doesn't uh, provide the answer. He just says, well, that's the way of palim. That's just the way we play with words. But I think that the answer actually appears in Yeshayahu. I brought for you this pasuk at the top of uh, page three, right after the Ibn Ezra in source four, Yeshayahu in chapter 63 is recalling the good old days when God saved us from Egypt. And look at what he says, Vayizkor yimei olam. Moshe Amo, he remembered the days of old when he pulled his people. Hama'alim yam et ro'e tsono, et cetera, et cetera, right? The one who took his, um, his, his, uh, his sheep out of the sea. This is a reference to Moshe, who is the puller of the people. Why is Moshe called Moshe and not Mashoi? Because the Mashoi part, the part where he was pulled out, is only... The first step, it's not the ultimate goal. The one who is pulled by others must become the puller of others, right? The one who others exercise compassion upon him, he's the one who has to exercise compassion upon others. So it's pointless to name him Mashoi because that's only the very, very early stages of Moshe's life. The ultimate goal is that the Mashoi should become a Moshe. Okay, so that's the story of Moshe's birth. Um, we see that Moshe really has these two identities and that the compassion of, of women in particular, uh, the, the, the intensity of the relationship in which someone is really, really willing to do remarkable things and defy the most powerful person in the world, um, you know, as a result of the passion and the intensity of their love and of their caring, so that ultimately is what lies at the heart of Moshe's life. Now, when we move into this second section, uh, go back uh, to, to page one, where I brought for you Shmot Perak Bet. The second section of Moshe's life starts in Pasuk Yud Aleph. But before we get there, right, we, we are already kind of wondering, what happened to Moshe? That's a lot of years that we skip over, right? We saw him when he was a baby. His mother nurses him. She weans him. He's brought to Bat Paro, and that would seem to be the end of the story. And again, you know, whenever we have these kind of blank years, the Midrashim always fill that in for us, right? But short of looking at the Midrashim for the moment, I want to ask the most obvious question, which is, Moshe's growing up in the palace. What happened to him? Who does he identify with? Has he become an Egyptian, right? I mean, you know... I, you've all seen the movie, right? Prince of Egypt, right? So, you know, he comes kind of uh, bounding out of the palace area, Ramesses, and then they go, you know, frolicking together. Two Egyptians, right? And that, by the way, obviously is the most logical scenario, right? That seems to me to be obvious. Yet maybe he was with his mother till he was three, I don't know, four, 
And then after that, those memories were, were erased or, or, or certainly suppressed, right? Does he ever see his mother again? Does she come on a yearly basis to you know, bring him a nice coat like, like Hana did? We don't know, we, don't, we really don't know. But what we assume is, is that those years in the palace have turned Moshe into quite the Egyptian. And by the way, when he eventually is gonna make his way to Midian, and he sits on the Be'er, and he meets the daughters of Reuel, and they go home to their father, right? And, and you know, their fathers say, how'd you get home? Madu ami harten bo hayom. How'd you get home so quickly? And they're going to say, ish mitzri hitzilanu. An Egyptian man saved us. And I want to think to myself, why do they think he's Egyptian? The answer is clear from ancient Egyptian art. <clears throat> There's a huge difference between the haircut of the Semites and the haircut of the Egyptians, right? It's the most basic um, kind of thing that you see when you see a person, their dress, their, their hairstyle. And so it's clear that Moshe looks Egyptian, right? Whatever it is that makes a person look Egyptian, he looks clearly Egyptian. There's no, um, there's a very big distinction between the way the Semites looked and the Egyptians looked. And he dresses, talks presumably, um, you know, got his hair cut, <laughs> grooms himself like, like an Egyptian. And so, you know, that would seem to answer our, our, our first query, but it's actually not so clear. Look, look at Pasuk Yud Aleph, look at what happens here. Vayi bayamim hahem, vayigdal Moshe, vayetzei el echav. Right, he goes out to his brethren. Vayar besiv lotam, and he sees their sufferings. Vayar ish mitzri make ish ivri me'echav. And he sees an Egyptian man who is striking a Hebrew man from his brothers. And so as soon as we meet Moshe coming out of the palace, we're pretty amazed, right? Look at that. Moshe identifies with his enslaved brethren, which itself, I think, earns him a lot of accolades from the different Parshanei Hamikra, from the different exegetes, right? Uh, you know, Ramban praises him for this, and Sforno, and Abarbanel, and some of the different Midrashim. Look at this. Moshe still has retained his deep sense of identity. That itself is Stunning, right? That says something about Moshe. And yet, I'm not sure this interpretation is the only way to go with understanding this pasuk. Um, Ibn Ezra has a remarkable reading of this pasuk. It's so remarkable that, you know, the, the, the supra commentaries on Ibn Ezra, and there are many, I think, aside from Rashi, he has the most people commenting on his commentary, right? The Ibn Ezra's really interesting, and they're they are really upset with this reading, okay? You'll see why in a moment. Look, look in source number five, okay? How does the Ibn Ezra read it? Vayetzei el echav hamitzrim ki barmona melechaya. The first echav in the Pasuk, when it says he went out to his brothers, think prince of Egypt, he went out to his Egyptian brothers. He goes out to hang out with the guys. He considers himself Egyptian. And the Ibn Ezra goes on and it says, but the second meaning, uh, the, se the, the meaning of the second echav in the pasuk, that's <laughs> his kir ivrimi mishpachto. That's clearly talking about the Hebrews. So the Ibn Ezra has done something very bold exegetically, right? You just have to note that in, as, as, as a separate comment, which is that he looks at a pasuk, he sees the same word appears twice, and he says, but it means totally opposite things, which is a very bold thing to say but it's also bold in terms of its meaning. What, what, what Ibn Ezra is, is saying here, it's a, it's a pretty audacious reading, right? It's also pretty unique. And as I said, some of the super commentaries <clears throat> want to kind of rework the Ibn Ezra so that he didn't actually say this. I'm certain he said this, and, and I'm certain also that it's a brilliant reading for all sorts of reasons, which, which, which I'll explain in a moment. But you know, I think it really, this reading, whether it's right or it's wrong, it demonstrates exceptional sensitivity to who Moshe is, because what is he really saying? He's really saying, when Moshe first leaves the palace, he absolutely identifies Egyptian. He goes out to be with his Egyptian brethren, right? And then it says, Vayar b'siv lo tam. Now we tend to read it as, he sees the sufferings of Am Yisrael. But that is not the only way to read it. It's a very ambiguous word. It could, not, it could be not a passive word, but an active word. He sees the sufferings that they are imposing upon others, 
right? The word sivlot later on in Parak Vav is going to appear as sivlot Mitzrayim, the sufferings that the Egyptians are imposing. And at that moment in the Ibn Ezra's reading, Moshe switches allegiance. Mid-course, mid-pasuk, right? right? In the middle of the pasuk, right? he goes out to be with the Egyptians, and you know, he looks at what they're doing, and he says, ah, I'm not one of them. I would rather be on the side of the oppressed than the oppressor, okay? It's a, an exceptionally sensitive reading to Moshe, because ultimately, when you ask the question, who is Moshe? <laughs> is he Israelite? Is he Egyptian? The answer is, he's neither. Moshe is a man of justice. He is a man that was born because of compassion. He was born because of morality in a world in which morality was absent. And he has adopted that course as his own. That is Moshe's identity. Moshe identifies with morality. He identifies with human compassion. He is a product of two different ethnicities, but more importantly, he is a product of women who exercised compassion in protecting him, in making sure that he survived. So, you know, that I think really accounts for the next events in Moshe's life, the ones that uh, Rev. Alex was talking about, right? We have these sort of, the series of three events in Moshe's life. Uh, Abar Benel already notes this. Later on, by the way, this is going to become um, a theme that, you know, Moshe's first three acts, so that Achad Ha'am actually writes this short little essay called Moshe, where he talks about Moshe's first three acts. Of course, you know, this is something that was already observed, uh, you know, by the Abarbanel. I, I believe Abarbanel is the first one to make this observation, which is that uh, Moshe's initial acts as he moves into adulthood are all acts of compassion. They're all acts of saving the oppressed from the oppressor, they're all acts that are none of his business, right? As, as uh, Alex said, I mean, I think that this is it's clearly the way that I view Moshe when he's sitting there by the well in Midian on his hands saying, I won't get involved, I won't get involved, I won't get involved. And he can't because he can't be any less than Moshe, right? Moshe can't be, uh, you know, any, anything less than, than himself. And, you know, the, um, the pasuk that, uh, that, that Abarbanel brings to describe Moshe, habet el amal lo yuchal. He cannot look at oppressions. That's a pasuk from Chavakuk, where Chavakuk is describing God, right? So that, you know, Moshe, he, I mean, you know, halavai, halavai, we should live in a society where more people cannot see oppression. It would probably change the course of human society, right? But this is Moshe. So Moshe gets involved in situations that are none of his business. He goes in, he saves the weak from the strong, and look at the, uh, the ethnicity of each of these people who he saves. Right? First he saves a Hebrew from the Egyptians, then he saves a Hebrew from a Hebrew, and then he saves non-Hebrews from non-Hebrews. Right? So Moshe is a man of universal justice. He rises above ethnicity, above ethnic considerations. And, you know, of course, um, uh, Moshe, uh, ultimately, this is very much part of who Moshe is. Moshe is the universal lawgiver, right? So this, of course, is preparing us for that aspect of Moshe. You know, but I, I, I want to talk for uh, um, a moment about uh, the, the quest for the Ish, right? The quest for the Ish, that's what we were talking about before, right? So that, you know, Moshe goes out, he, he's looking for a man, he sees an Ish Mitzri, He's Maken Ish Ivri. He says, I want nothing of that. Then he sees these two Ish Ivris fighting amongst each other. He says, I want nothing of that. Right? Who is Moshe? Vayif and ko vacho vayar ki ein ish. Right? That's what Moshe sees. He looks around and he says, there's no man here. I can't become a man. The kind of man that I want to be. I can't become that man here. Not the oppressed and not the oppressor. Nobody can teach me how to be the kind of adult that I want to be in this society. And so Moshe runs away, right? And again, you know, that's a bit of a, of a stretch, but that's the way Rashi reads it. I just want to show you um, a couple of psukim that seem, look at this pasuk in Yeshayahu. Look in source number seven. This is the way Yeshayahu kind of reuses our story, right? Look, Yeshayahu here in, um, in Perak Nuntet, 
in, in, uh, Perak, uh, in chapter 59, is describing a, an, an unjust society, right? It happens to be our society that he's describing at this point, but we look a lot like Egypt, unfortunately, at this point, right? Look at what he says, right? Uh, righteousness has, uh, justice has turned backward. Righteousness is really standing very far away from us. Truth has stumbled in the marketplace. And straightforwardness can't arrive, it can't come. Truth is gone. Right? You see it? God sees. There's no man in that society. That's what gives me also, I think, the support to say that this uh, description of Moshe is not, you know, Moshe looking around furtively and making sure, or it's not just, you know, that there's nobody looking before he kills the Egyptian, but there's something a lot deeper that's going on here. It's Moshe looking around and saying, there's nobody in this society that, 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 that can help me to become that ish. Vayarki ain ish. There's no ish. And so he runs away. Now, the reason I say it's a bit of a stretch um, is because, of course, the psukim tell us that, um, that, that, you know, Moshe runs away from Paro, right? Paro wants to kill him, um, you know, and, and he finds out that Paro wants to kill him. Of course, you know, he sees these two, Jew, these two Hebrews fighting, right? And he says to them, you know, he says to the Rasha, Lama takereecha, why are you hitting your friend? Why are you not exercising proper uh, interactions, creating a society of re'im? What's a society of Re'im? That's our society, right? What's the center of Tanakh? Or center, sorry, the center of the Torah. Center of the Torah is Sefer Vayikra. If I ask you what Sefer Vayikra is about, what are you going to say? Corbano, right? <laughs> no, you won't, because you all are too sophisticated to say that, right? So what is, what is, what is Sefer Vayikra about? Sefer Vayikra is about Kedusha. It's about creating an existence of holiness. It's about living with God in our midst. And it's divided into three sections. The first section is Kedushat HaMakom, creating a spatial kind of Kedusha. That's the Mikdash and its environs and, and Eretz Israel. The, 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 the third part of Sefer Vikra is about Kedushat HaZman. It's Parshat Emor. It's about creating a temporal framework of Kedusha. And the middle is Kedushat HaAdam. It's about finding Kiddushah in ourselves. Now, Kiddushah Adam is kind of framed by what we call the arayot, right? The, the parshiot of forbidden sexual relationships. It's about creating a certain kind of sexual purity. But what's the middle of the middle of the middle? It's Kiddushim Tihiyu. It's about morality. You know what the central pasuk there is? V'avtal recha kamocha. Zek Gadova Torah, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. The, the, the ultimate formula for creating a viable society, one that's based on compassion, is looking at another person and seeing a reflection of your humanity in them. It's about the Tzalem Elohim. When Moshe turns to this Hebrew and says, Lama Taker Re'echa, He's giving him the tools for creating a different sort of society. And this person turns to him and says, Mi samcha le'ish sar v'shofet aleinu. Who made you a man? You're not a man. You're not a man of justice. You're not a man who has any sort of authority. And we don't want that kind of man in our society. And that's when Moshe throws up his hands in despair and leaves. Now the reason I say this, even though it's a little bit against the pshat, it's because Rashi says it, right? Rashi says, well, there's a pshat here that he runs away from Moshe. But what's the midrash? And Rashi says it just like that. He says, keep shuto, there is a pshat. Umidrasho, what's the deeper meaning here? Moshe looked around and said, achein no dahadavar. Now I understand why these people are enslaved and I want no part of them. And he goes hightailing it out of Egypt. Moshe has not found his man. So how is Moshe going to become Ha-ish if all he sees around him is Ish Mitzri, Ish Ivri, Ein Ish, Ein Ish, Sar Vishofet, right? There's nobody here. And that's the story of Yitro.
That's the end of the story. I, he's not called Yitro there. He's called Reuel. So I'll just be precise, but I think he's better known as Yitro. If it's the same man, if it's father and son, if it's two brothers, if it's some sort of machatan, it doesn't really matter, right? They're, for our purposes, that's the family that Moshe, um, uh, um, you know, marries into. The story of meeting Yitro is the story of Moshe finding his man. Right? Because again, of course, you know, what happens there once again is that we have this story of uh, the weak uh, that is being oppressed by the strong. That's the story of the daughters of Ruel. They get to this well, you know, they're, they're, they, they, they laboriously draw water for their animals. And along come the Roim, the local shepherds, and they push aside the girls and they steal their labor, basically. Right? They steal their water. And Moshe just can't abide that. And so Moshe, by Yigarashu, Moshe chases them away. And they water their flocks, right, with the water that they have drawn, and they go home. And Reuel says to them, Madua miharten bohayom. How'd you get home so quickly today? Which teaches us what? That's a daily occurrence, right? How'd you get home so quickly today? Yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before. You got home hours later because you drew water for every local who then stole your labor. And they say to him, Ish Right, an Egyptian man, he saved us from those shepherds, and then he himself drew water for us. It's sort of the classical, classic uh, betrothal scene, right? Uh, so, you know, he draws water for them, and, and, and Ruel gets a little bit annoyed at them. And he says, well, well look inside. Right? Look at, we'll go back to the, um, to, to the description itself. In Perak Bed, Pasuk Yudchet, Vatavona El Ru El Avihem, they come to Ru El, their father, Vayomer, Madua Mihar Ten Boayom, how'd you get home so quickly today? Vatomarna Ish Mitri Tilanu, they say, oh, it's an Egyptian man, he's misidentified, right, at this, at this scene. Vigandalo Dalala, Vayashka Tatson, Vayomer El Benotav, the Ayo, where is he? Lama Ze Azav Ten et Haish. Moshe has become the man. He's become the man that he seeks. There's the ish with the hey ha yidiah, right? And what is it that Ruel is saying to his girls? You can't leave him there, right? He did a kindness for you. But more importantly, who else is looking for the man? Ruel. So it's this that I think kind of um, spawns the famous Midrash, it's a pretty famous Midrash because it appears in many different contexts. It appears in Gemara and Sota, it appears in a Targum, it appears in the Midrash Rabbah, it really appears in a lot of contexts, that when Paro was deciding what to do with this kind of pesky nation who's become a nuisance because of their numbers, right? So he says, what should I do with them? So he calls in his three advisors. Do you remember this Midrash? Bil'am, Iov, and Yitro, right? So Bil'am says, Kill them all, enslave them, kill them, you know, and, and you know, it's his advice he takes. That's why Bil'am later has to be killed. Eov stays silent. He's the opposite of Moshe. That's why later on Eov suffers. That's according to this Midrash. And Yitro, what does Yitro do? He runs away. She says, I don't want to be part of this society. And he runs away. Now, in that kind of, you know, Midrashic tale, so who is Yitro? Yitro is Moshe. And Yitro is in search of that man. And so when he hears, there's somebody here, Shehitzil, Ish Mitri Hitzilanu. Now I know from later on, from later on in the story of Yitro, turn to, uh, turn to page four here. I did read for you this Gemara and Sota. Turn to page four, look at, look at source number 10. Later on, at the beginning of Parshat Yitro, when Yitro comes to visit Moshe at Har Elokim, right, uh, when, right before Matan Torah, or right after Matan Torah, depending on the chronology. But okay, look at what, look at what we're told. Why did Yitro come? Vayichad Yitro al kol asher asah shem Yisrael, asher hitzilo miyad Mitzrayim. He's so happy that God saved. And what does he say? Baruch Hashem, asher hitzil etchem. If you read through that parak, the word Yitzil appears over and over and over. What moves Yitro? What moves Reuel? Compassion. The, the, the courage, the tenacity, the, the, the fortitude, the desire to save the other. That's what moves 
Yitro. And so Yitro says, bring him home to me, right? Don't leave him there. Madua, lama ze azavten et ha'ish. That's the man. And then Moshe gets to Yitro. Look at it inside. Look at source, um, <coughs> the first source, right? On the first page, Pasuk Kaf Aleph. Moshe comes to Yitro, eats bread with him, or Yitroel in this case, by Yoel Moshe Lashevet et Haish. The man found the man, right? And, and you know, this is really, I think, the initial story of Moshe. Moshe in search of this person that he can perceive as the ultimate, um, you know, the, the ultimate role model for him, the one after whom he can pattern his adult life. He can't find it in Egypt. He can't find it among the slaves. And Ha'ish meets Ha'ish. You know, there's a wonderful Midrash that Abarbanel brings here. I brought it for you in the, in the words of the Abarbanel. Look in source number 12. It's Excalibur. It's the sword and the stone, this Midrash. The Midrash is as follows. Amruba Midrash, Shemate Ha'elokim Hayad Natua Bepardeso Shel Yitro. Velo Ayayachol Shum Adam Lizuzo Mimkomo Rak Moshe Dal Zeni Tansi Parabito Lo Leisha. Right? He gets to marry. So, what's the story? The story is, is that the, 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 that staff of God that Moshe is later on going to walk around with, that was buried deeply in Yitro's orchard. And everybody comes and tries to uproot it. It's such a desirable staff, and nobody can do it. And Moshe comes and plucks it up. And that's why he gets to marry Tzipora. But what's the idea? The idea, of course, is that this is Yitro's sense of justice. It's his sense of truth and compassion. And Yitro doesn't have the means to release it on the world until he meets Moshe. Moshe at the well does not meet a wife with whom he creates a legacy through children. I mean, he does meet a wife, but his legacy is not through his children. Right? Moshe does not have a vertical legacy, unfortunately. That's true sometimes. He has a horizontal legacy. Moshe at the well meets a father-in-law with whom he creates a partnership of releasing justice on the world, of creating a better universal world, a better world for everybody. And the ultimate moment in which we understand the profound um, uh, nature of that meeting is at the beginning of, uh, or yeah, the beginning of Parsha Itro. With this, we'll conclude. But I want you, before we read this, which is on the last page, I want you just to look at source 13. Remember what we had among Am Yisrael when Moshe says to the Rasha, Lama takere echa. Why are you hitting your friend? And he says, Misam chali ish sar He says in that sort of, you know, almost mocking tone, Who made you the sar? Who made you the shofet? We don't want mishpat here, right? Okay, look at what happens when Moshe re meets Yitro later on in the story. And, you know, of course, Yitro says to him, You know, what are you doing? And, and look at what Moshe says, you know, because he sees it. Moshe's working a little too hard. He's judging people all day, all night, right? Uh, uh, look at Pasuk Tetvat. Vayomer Moshe lechotno, ki yavo ilai ha'am lidrosh Elohim, ki yelem davar ba'ilai, v'shafatiti ben ish uvein re'ehu. When people come to me, I want to judge between people and their friend. I want to maintain collegiality. I want to maintain camaraderie. I want to maintain a society of v'yavta l'reacha kamocha where people see each other as re'im. And the only way to do that is to create a strong justice system, says Moshe. And, you know, Yitro may agree with him, right? And, of course, Moshe then says, I tell them the way of God, the moral way of God. This isn't good. This isn't going to work, right? It's a, good, it's a good goal, right? But the way you're doing it isn't good. Look at what he said. He says, you've got to appoint other, other people alongside of you. Vata. Techeze mikola am. Find those men, those men of, 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 of valor. Yir Elohim, Anshe Emet. Right? Remember what was missing in that society which didn't have truth, right? Sone um, Vata. This Samta Alehem, Sare Alafim, Sare Meot, Sare Hamishim, Sare Asarot, Vishaf Tuataam. Mi Samcha Leish. 
Sar Vishofet Aleinu, Visamta Lehem Sarim Vishaftu Alechem. It's all the same words. What was missing among Am Yisrael, and what was missing, of course, among the Egyptians, right, back in Egypt, that takes a partnership between Moshe and Yitro in order to release it on the world, right? Moshe, uh, go, maybe we'll conclude just by answering our question, right? Moshe begins the story as a man among men, right? Never mentions God in Perak Bet. That's not his quest, right? In fact, even I would say in terms of his ethnic identity, it's really questionable in that first Perak. Moshe is chosen on the backdrop of his moral responsibility, of his compassion, of his abil ability to fight against all odds for, uh, for, for, for saving the oppressed from the oppressor, for creating a society of justice, of seeing the other, of compassion. And I'll conclude with one final point, and that is that in Shmot, I didn't bring this for you, but in Shmot, Per Gimel, when uh, Moshe um, turns aside to, to go to the burning bush, right? Uh, the, the, and he sees it, right? And, and the Pasuk tells us, um, <clears throat> the Pasuk tells us, uh, Moshe says, Asura nave ere et hamare'a gadol azem adol lo yivar hasne. Right? I'm going to go see. Vayar Hashem kisar lirot. God sees that he turned aside to see. So we all say, well, you know, it takes a certain spiritual sensitivity to go look at the world, to see God in the world. The Midrash says differently. The Midrash says, you know why God saw Moshe? Not because, you know why God chose Moshe and appeared to him in the theophany? Not because he went to see the burning bush, but Vayar Hashem kisar lirot et am Yisrael. God saw that Moshe in the previous chapter had seen Am Yisrael, Vayar b'siv lotam. He saw their burdens. He saw uh, what, what they were going through and that that was ultimately going to make him the best leader of all. Thank you.